I must admit that approaching this 2012 Left Forum conference, I was a little concerned that with probably 4,000 people and 400, more than 400 panels, this would be a um, chaotic disaster at some level, and I've been pleasantly surprised that it is an outstanding success. Every panel, or almost every panel, had a very good audience. Many of the panels, according to the people I spoke with, were interesting. Some of them were very controversial. Uh, I talked to somebody about Iran. There were two Iranian panels that she attended. She was outraged by both of them, but they actually stimulated her thought, which is the most you can expect. Uh, I participated in three panels, one on the future of the labor movement, which was very, very well attended, and the um, uh, problem of uh, jobs, the jobless future, which was also very well attended. But this m afternoon, I, we had a panel which was really about the limits of protest and resistance with uh, four panelists, uh, Michael Pelius, um, John Clark of New Orleans, Peter Bratzis, who teaches at Stalford, uh, England, at, near Manchester, and myself. It was a panel which uh, had a very uh, lively discussion and a very active audience. The audience was practically all involved in talking, in disputing, in arguing. And what we really were talking about is not that we were at all opposed to protests and resistance, but that we argued all of us, that protest and resistance was a necessary and a dramatic and a very uh, inspiring development over the last uh, six months, especially with the emergence of the Occupy movement. But it was not sufficient to sustain itself over a long period of time. And so what we had is a, is a two-hour discussion, more or less a two-hour discussion, as to what was possible in terms of creating alternatives to the corporate state, alternatives to the increasing repressive state under which we all live in the United States, where the army, as well as the um, police, have become militarized. The army is always militarized, but the police have become militarized in clearing out protesters, where there really is a great rise of conversation on the right, and the left is still not having a serious conversation. John Clark actually presented a view that where we are now is the need to create uh, communities as, which would have workplaces, which would have consumer societies, which would have neighborhood uh, governance of one kind or another, that would to a large extent be an alternative to the centralized uh, government, either of the city of New Orleans or the state of Louisiana. And he says some of that is going on. And he says he, uh, that there were 25,000 people who responded to um, the Katrina catastrophe by volunteering, and some of them have stayed in New Orleans and they're trying to rebuild some communities. Peter Bratzis made an argument which I thought was incontrovertible, that is to say it was hard to refute, that the nature of the state, the nature of government has changed so it is no longer really uh, responsive to the people. No matter how much activity you have, no matter how much protest you have, no matter how much um, um, anger you have at what, at what is going on, both in terms of the war uh, in, in Afghanistan right now and the militarization of American society and the refusal of both of the national government, the, sta the executive branch, uh, which includes the president and the Congress to actually enact serious reforms in health care and other areas like education. No matter how much protest we've had in the last six months uh, and before that, uh, the, the state is not going to be responsive. And he gave the example of Greece and Italy, especially Greece, where you have massive protests, where you have um, general strikes which are, in, which are unimaginable in the United States and still they have not been able to make any change. And, and one of the reasons for that is they don't have a program of what they mean by a, a, the good life. That is to say, they weren't, they're not oriented to changing life, they're oriented to improving the lives that they have within the framework of the existing state. Um, I actually um, said that one of the things about the old left, which John had, in, had opened up, one of the things about the old left was that the old left created institutions which took care of people's needs. And I cited health care, and I cited dental care, I cited uh, cultural activity, recreation activity, summer camps, 
um, a whole variety of activities that the communists uh, in the uh, 30s, 40s, and even through the 50s offered to their members and to their families, the families uh, even on their periphery who were not members, that really met their needs in ways that the government did not and the ways in which private organizations like corporations did not. We had a brief period where there was pensions and health care offered by um, uh, government, especially uh, by uh, uh, private corporations that were organized. And now with the decline of union organization, if we're going to rebuild the left, I argue, we need to recreate those institutions that take care of people's needs, not simply do protest and resistance. Some, we used to call it in the uh, uh, 1960s in the New Left, we called it prefigurative activity. That is something that prefigures what we want as life. And so the point of the left should be that we want to change life, not simply that we want to protest what already exists. Let's take a follow a specific story that is undoubtedly one of the most important stories of the week from September 30th to October the 12th today. On September the 30th, like many other newspapers around the country, the New York Times reported an impending pilot's strike against Continental Airlines, which had demanded of the unions that represented the workers for the airlines a wage cut. The Continental Airlines workers rejected the wage cut and went out on strike. That was, that was on Friday, September the 30th. It was on the front page of the New York Times. And by Saturday, although there was a pilot's story, and you can see there's a pilot story, you would think it was the same pilots that, that went on strike against Continental Airlines. By Saturday, October 1st, those pilots disappeared and new pilots appeared, pilots that were asking for the end of the boycott against the Russians for their caper of the Korean Airlines 007. This is the last time that the Continental Strike is featured in the New York Times news section, October 1, 1983. On Saturday, October 8, we get a news story about the Continental Airlines Strike, but it is in the business day of Saturday, October 8, and it is a kind of a roundup story of how the Continental Airlines strike is doing. A wrenching day, a wrench, wrenching week at airline. This story has not been preceded by a systematic coverage by the New York Times staff of what has now become one of the major issues, not only in labor relations, but also the major issue for the airlines. Can collective bargaining survive the deregulation of airlines, which means that there will be no regulation of rates and wages have to be negotiated across the table at a condition of recession in the airlines. On Sunday, October the 9th, in the business section again, we get a story about how the corporate assault on wages is going on, and the corporate assault on wages mentions the Continental Airlines strike. In the corporate assault on wages story, there's a quite accurate um, story by Stephen Greenhouse, a reporter for the New York Times, about how now the New York, uh, the, uh, the corporations have decided that in the light of deregulation and of recession, the way they're going to deal with their loss of profits and the threats that they have to their industrial position is to make the workers pay. It's a decent story. And so is the one on the 8th. But the story is from the point of view of business. The question for the New York Times is not whether workers' wages and working conditions will be maintained in the light of the corporate assault on wages, but whether corporate profits will be maintained, which I suppose is really an appropriate discussion for a business page of a daily newspaper. The fact of the matter is that in the 10 or 11 days that the New York Times has had the opportunity to cover the Continental Airlines strike, we cannot find in the news section any serious systematic coverage of the strike. Now, this, of course, compares very unfavorably to their meticulous, many-faceted coverage of the Soviet downing of the Korean airline 
007 um, over the, uh, the Sakhalin Islands uh, several months earlier. The Times was full of front page and middle page coverage of that, stri of, that, of that event. But the Continental Airlines strike, which is being covered, by the way, meticulously by the Wall Street Journal as a business story, is only covered by the New York Times as a business story. It is not covered by the Times as a serious national event. This is an indication of the fact that the New York Times, as a magazine, is capable of giving adequate, although superficial, coverage of sports, of the living, of furniture, of science, often of entertainment, but is not really capable any longer of giving systematic coverage of significant news stories unless they are international news stories and unless they are significantly fed to them by government agencies. It is clear that the continental struggle is a very, very controversial struggle and so controversial that the New York Times can barely in its main body of news coverage define it as a, as a serious and a worthy news story. Had I the time, I could show that there are many other news stories. Of course, New York, forget it. New York doesn't count for the New York Times. But even national news stories, national news stories about real social movements, real struggles of people, real activity. This continental strike is duplicated potentially in many other instances. The New York Times simply doesn't care. What it really does care about is international news on the one hand, White House handouts, the occasional investigative reporting by very good reporters of the New York Times, and a whole significant magazine format which renders the New York Times as a newspaper of record basically defunct. I think the New York Times is essentially entertainment. And I think we ought to be treating the New York Times as nothing more than whiling away our times when we have nothing better to do. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. This show, from its very beginning, was intended to be a forum for debate and discussion on the possible transformation of America and the world, politically, economically, intellectually, and spiritually. We had clear objectives. It was always about how to build a socially and economically just world rooted in multiracial, multinational, multigender, multisexual orientations, relationships forged in radical love and freedom, focusing on empowering the least of us. Long before the public lynching, death of George Floyd, the pandemic, and the neo-fascist gangster in the White House, the show has tried to explore the truths and lies of who we are and what our system is really about. Too many have lived too many lies for too long. The lies we see and experience today have festered over time and show greater distortion, complexity, and destructiveness than ever. The need for urgency for transformative change is as great as it's ever been. Stanley Aronowitz has powerfully informed every Radical Imagination show we've done since his appearance as co-hosts on the first one five years ago. Pulling the covers off society's charades has been Stanley's life work, and he's done it vigorously with a radical imagination, respect for scholarship and ideas, love of life, art, and music, and with a sense of grace and much fun. Through his many books and articles over six decades, from false promises, working class hero, from the ashes of the old to the death and life of American labor, Stanley has been pulling the cover off the organized labor movement, pointing the way toward a new workers' movement. That movement goes beyond resistance, rebellion, and passivity to the corporate, militaristic America that we all live in. It establishes prefigurative relationships and political activity which can create a true egalitarian and democratic society. As Stanley puts it, we need to change life and not just protest what already exists. We have two of Stanley's closest colleagues, friends, and associates on today to discuss his work 
as one of America's best known labor public intellectuals and labor activists. Michael Pelius is a philosophy professor at Long Island University in Brooklyn, co-editor with Stanley of Situations Magazine, a project of the radical imagination, and Stanley's longtime friend, colleague, collaborator, and confidant. Emmanuel Ness is a longtime labor activist and scholar of workers, social organizations, comparative labor movements, global South relations, migration and protest movements. He's editor of, journal, of, of the Journal of Labor and Society, is a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, the City University of New York, and also a senior research associate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Johannesburg. And he too is a close collaborator, friend, and confidant, correct, of Stanley Arano. And I want to wish both of you the best, and, and I'm so grateful for you to be on this show here talking and honoring uh, Stanley's work. So welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It really is. It's really great yeah. to have you two again. Uh, and um, so, so maybe we can get started on how you both started your relationship and collaboration with Stanley in in those early days, and uh, what were some of the, some of the foundations and roots of that those conversations you were having with Stanley and his work, particularly as it relates to the labor movement. Why don't we start with uh, Manny? Uh, thanks. Um, I've known Stanley for quite some time. Actually, it goes back. Uh, my, my recognition of Stanley's important work goes back actually to the early 1980s uh, when I read his book, False Promises. And uh, then subsequently, uh, another 10 years later, 10 to 15 years later, when I, I was a student of his. Mm -hmm. And um, as a student of uh, Stanley, um, you know, I recognized that uh, he was putting forward an argument that was very different than the conventional labor and employment relations uh, academic who is crunching numbers and uh, looking at uh, ways in which um, organized labor uh, in the truest of the sense, unions themselves can build their power uh, or build their numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stanley, unlike many others, was not interested in looking at the union density uh, necessarily. He was interested in looking at the democracy that existed within the uh, unions and amongst workers uh, in various workplaces. So uh, we also had uh, very long discussions, I recall, in the 2000s, early 2000s, about late 90s and early 2000s, about the uh, significance of the new working force that was um, emerging in New York City. I think we all remember it. It was a New York City that uh, we suddenly found ourselves um, surrounded by foreign workers, many of them from Mexico and so forth, who were employed in the uh, restaurant industry, in the grocery industry, and so forth and so on, delivery, etc. Yeah. And uh, we were trying to assess the uh, significance of that on the broader working class of, uh, of New York. Uh, and that, uh, you know, relationship has continued through the years in terms of uh, my knowledge and our discussions about uh, the questions of um, the capacity of workers and working class solidarity over the years. You know, one point that you made at the very beginning, Jim, is that um, he uh, was incredibly interested, not just in protest, because he and I had a similar view that protest does happen everywhere every single day. Of course, there are uh, fits and starts, but we will find protest in many parts of the world. I do much of my work in the global south. However, the big issue, and we might have some uh, areas of difference on, uh, on this question, is whether working class power can be gained as a consequence, working class self-activity and so forth and uh, expression uh, uh, through agency. Uh, so uh, agency becomes a very important issue uh, in all of uh, my work, but his work especially, you know, what, what is the 
American union movement all about? And what are other unions around uh, the world trying to do to advance uh, the interests uh, of um, the vast majority of the population of the work world who are actually workers today? You know, he sure. did write the book, The Jobless Future, as you pointed out earlier. And that is true. But, you know, we do have a jobless present now, mm. yet amongst the jobless are workers who are working part time, who are working informally and in contingent types of jobs. So anyway, uh, I really look forward to this discussion and, and, and thanks, Jim, for having me on. Sure, I'm so glad you are here and I'm so glad, Michael, you've joined us as well because okay. you have so much to say and you've been working with Stanley also for so many years. So. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I think we're really yeah. honored to have Jim, I mean, to have a, a few Jim, of course, hosting this program and continuing this uh, homage to Stanley's work and him through his contributions to education and culture and uh, to uh, basically even uh, black freedom and civil rights movements uh, earlier on the on the show, The Radical Imagination. But we're, we're particularly privileged to have Manny here today, who is one of the leading people in the labor movement, both as a theorist and someone who is on the ground. Um, in terms of my own relationship uh, to Stanley, um, you know, I had known of Stanley's work uh, you know, since the uh, middle 70s, when I was a student in Baltimore, I was very interested in, um, you know, uh, Marxist approaches to literature and, and to philosophy. And I was an active reader of Georgi Lukács, uh, History and Class Consciousness, which had just come out. And, um, um, and uh, so I had a very long struggle and road forward through philosophy and uh, literature through Marxist studies. And Stanley was the first person that I actually could read in terms of labor studies <laughs> and, and a very accessible book, False Promises, that sort of, you know, transformed me in, in one way, very much in one way where I began to see the, the, the culture of labor struggle rather than just as Manny pointed yeah. out, labor density or statistical approaches or collective bargaining uh, struggles, much more of the culture of the working class, which was very, very real to me. So the book False Promises had a profound effect on me, even though I didn't know him. I, I also knew of Stanley uh, before meeting him personally through social text because of a friend of mine in um, Madison, Wisconsin, where the first issue of social text came out. And this was Stanley's foray into, if you will, post-structuralist thinking, you know, uh, a kind of a moment that hit the United States through a, a kind of French and German invasion in the, uh, in the early 70s, all the way through the postmodern moment into the 80s. And so through social text, I also learned of his work and I learned the scope of his uh, intellect he wrote a, a seminal piece on film, the high art form of late capitalism, as a, as a, a first piece about that. Also looking at the Kuleshov effect and also labor involved in, in, in uh, you know, the, the, the cinema industry, et cetera, and the cultural apparatus. So I then had the pleasure, once I moved to New York, to meet Stanley. I was invited to attend his, his, uh, his uh, class on the Grundrisse at the Graduate Center, you know, and I was at the new school then. And uh, we hit it off immediately. We, we riffed on film, we riffed on labor studies, philosophy, et cetera. And since then have been very, very, very good friends. In 2005, we started Situations, Project of the Radical Imagination together. Uh, we've been teaching alternative um, uh, classes through the Institute of Radical Imagination for the last uh, 10 years, first at the Breck Forum, the Commons, and now kind of virtually uh, we're doing it, but uh, for many years, alternative classes, and in that class, I still have notebooks filled like this, even you know after many years of studying the history of the left, according to Stanley, and I, I know, Jim, you've attended some of those uh, very good classes. Yeah. So my relationship is very deep. You know, we're also, as you said, confidants and very close as, uh, as friends uh, for those years. And I, I think I know the work fairly well. I, I read a lot of the unpolished uh, manuscripts. So I've uh, had that long uh, conversation with him as things shape up. 
uh, after false promises. Now, yeah. yeah, help us yeah. help our audience in particular here get grounded in terms of our discussion here um, in their understanding of what organized labor, uh, the organized labor movement was, the history of it, which of course you both have studied and, and Stanley has, and what went wrong. What is the, what are the critiques that you have and and that Stanley had? So so for our audience benefit now, give us some structure as to what the false promises were. What what the what went wrong uh, in that organized uh, labor movement and what needs to happen now at this point. So sure. I'm going to defer to Manny on this. Uh, yeah, get us started. started and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe piggyback. It. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, False Promises was written in the early 1970s. Right. You know, without question, the apogee of the power of the, the uh, U.S. labor movement. But concomitantly, it was also the period where capital uh, went on attack against organized labor. You know, we'll have to remember that the post-war accords conferred labor a modicum of power within the workplace. And, you know, workers at General Motors, and uh, which is the largest company, Ford, et cetera, a large auto company, uh, were making very high wages relative to uh, uh, the professional classes even uh, of workers. And right. they became, in some respects, if I, if I may, uh, a form of labor aristocracy you know, where they would have second homes, uh, a mobile home, et cetera, and so forth and so on. But this began to change. Um, and I, I think uh, probably um, uh, the, the most important uh, example, which is found in for, uh, False Promises, is the Lordstown uh, strike, which uh, represents chapter one of his work, or the very beginning of the work, which was uh, Lordstown, Ohio, was uh, a new plant that was built by GM uh, to produce Chevy, I believe Vegas. I don't think anybody remembers the car anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, not a very good car, to tell you the truth. Right. It was a little, together, uh, little small guy, I think. Remember yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, and it was, uh, you know, um, they, you know, they hired a workforce, and this workforce was very militant. Not only were they militant, and this is really very important with respect to understanding the decline of labor. They were more militant than their leaders. They were more militant than the folks that were in Detroit uh, at the UAW headquarters. And so they went on a wildcat strike. They went on an unauthorized strike against the 22-day strike against uh, General Motors. But the strike was not necessarily just against General Motors. It was also against the union. Uh, the union leadership was opposed to the strike. And these fairly young, uh, probably mostly men, obviously, uh, uh, young workers were um, uh, engaged in uh, not just striking, but also um, uh, vandalizing some of the cars they actually built. Um, what year was this, Benny, again? What year were you? Uh, it was actually 1972. Okay. 1972. And this really represents, just right before the uh, major uh, transformation, you know, the move toward the neoliberalism. Uh, you find uh, workers saying, you know, we've had it with the kind of industrial speed up that takes place within the workplace where we have to slap together parts within a, you know, an automobile or whatever kind of assembly line. And it's monotonous work. And this gets to the question of culture as well. It has, it's meaningless. It's a process that is repetitive. It's a process in which um, workers- Mind numbing and heart wrenching. Yeah, yeah, so, it, so. It, it, it's exploitative even in the context of lower wages. Uh, and, and so of course wages declined dramatically subsequently. And I remember meeting with, uh, with Stanley in Detroit years later, we were talking about Lordstown uh, uh, again. And at that time, General Motors was trying to cut health benefits. In fact, they succeeded in cutting their relationship to um, providing health benefits to, 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 to the workers. And the book goes on to discuss other uh, segments, uh, other sectors of the economy and so forth, and how workers are really, and this goes to what Michael is, is really uh, uh, studies and his uh, analysis, uh, that, that workers are alienated from the process of wor uh, work in the United States. 
they find that there is absolutely no meaning whatsoever in what they're producing. They're producing things, automobiles, or they're producing services, etc., that really do not contribute to the cultural vibrancy of their lives. And so, you know, a strike is something that's highly um, exciting. I've uh, helped organize a number of strikes, and it contributes. You know, it's a it's it's a phenomenon that is very rare in some respects, although people do go on strikes frequently. Uh, why do I say rare and frequently? But throughout the world, it's frequent. But the decision to go on a strike means that you are not going to get paid for a period of time, and you are um, asking uh, management for uh, you know a better contract or so forth and so on. Uh, this strike was not so much for a better contract, but for better treatment, because in many ways, um, the workers were exploited. Uh, their labor was uh, uh, exploited uh, in the sense, in a Marxian sense, uh, sense uh, surplus value was extracted from them uh, in the process of production and so forth. Uh, they, they were forced to work and they continued to work these monotonous jobs. Michael Burroway, the sociologist, uh, eminent labor scholar, uh, wrote a book subsequently. And it's very interesting that Stanley wrote the first book on this, to this topic with false to promises. But Michael Burroway, who many people know, who wrote the book uh, that uh, deals with uh, the, the question of um, uh, the, the kind of disdain that workers had within the workplace, that they were in the workplace to just make out, just to finish, you know, they went to work, they engaged in various kinds of production activities, they, they did their jobs, they didn't necessarily do them in a way that uh, was meaningful to them in any way. The name of the book um, is Manufacturing Consent, actually, uh, the Chomsky and Herman work uh, was published much later. Uh, but this, this Manufacturing Consent was truly about manufacturing and it's probably it remains uh, published, I think, in the 1979, uh, remains a classic work uh, about how workers um, really have lost their connection to their unions to a large extent. They, they and, don't and, the system, have, yeah. and the system was further dividing workers, correct, as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can get into it if you'd like to uh, hear more what? about it, because, because, and again, Stanley's work is very important because he demonstrates Tell that us. there's a large degree of differentiation yeah. uh, amongst the workforce. They're, they're not only alienated from their, like I said, their job, but they're, they don't have a solidarity that um, one would have found in the 1930s during the Flint sit-down strike, where workers came together and this gives you a kind of historical traje tra trajectory yeah. uh, 40, 30 years earlier uh, to establish uh, the United Auto Workers and uh, to establish a highly militant labor movement and labor union in this case and movement that, um, that would uh, be based on solidarity. Now, of course, a lot has happened in between uh, the 1930s and the 1970s and the 1970s and the 2020s. So. I think that this this work uh, is a seminal uh, project, uh, False Promises, and it, it continues to be compelling today. I believe it was republished by Duke University Press. Yes. Uh, I have both versions, yes. the original version. Yes. And, yeah. and, and it is because work remains an alienating process, uh, that, that nothing has necessarily changed. And uh, as Stanley would say, uh, trade unions, uh, labor unions that are there to, so to speak, represent them socially, uh, as well as uh, in collective bargaining and so forth, have become nothing more than really insurance companies. Uh, you know, managing the kind of uh, collective bargaining agreements they would engage in, managing their uh, pensions and so forth and so on. Exactly. And that there, there's, there, there is a separated union staff that is highly uh, disconnected to the struggles uh, within the shop floor, and that does not build working class solidarity with absolutely. And that's what that's what Stanley is so much talking about uh, in terms of these political uh, formations, uh, formative movements that are needed, and and cooperative commonwealth uh, that he experienced in so many ways as he grew up. 
uh, with labor-sponsored cooperative housing and healthcare centers. Uh, Michael, you want to pick up? Yeah, on I was going to just uh, uh, just a couple of things about the facts. You know, um, false promises. 1973 was the first edition. The first edition and uh, represents as Manny has very eloquently and, uh, and in detail pointed out was a paradigm shift in labor studies. Uh, it was the first book, at least to my knowledge, that tried to integrate meaningless alienated labor alongside a labor history and multiple struggles. And as Manny pointed out, begins with a strike, a wildcat strike that not necessarily was only about uh, the, the bosses, but it was also about the union <laughs> and the union's inability to represent uh, fairly its workers and take on significant issues other than that of the usual wages and benefits packages. And that the struggle was really for recognition. It was very much in philosophical terms, a fight to the death for recognition in Hegelian terms in many ways. And Stanley understood this very deeply, you know, unlike I think a lot of the people that wrote very well about labor up until him, but he understood the struggle for recognition for daily, respect, everyday, everyday will. life. Well, for respect, but recognition is the thing that you're actually acknowledged as a human being yeah. and that you are given a place in the society. Your niche, your practice is recognized, right? In a way, yeah. So I, I think this was really part of the force of the book that opened it up to say, you know, quote, philosophers, you know, I put that highly in quotes, such as myself, you know, et cetera, because here is someone dealing with the question of alienation, you know, reification and the objectification of the labor force in a very original and very, uh, you know, deepened, deepened understanding of the culture that produced it and the culture that rose up against only collective bargaining, as Manny pointed out. You know, another thing that's very radical about Stanley, most people say that NLRB was a great thing, the establishment in, during the New Deal, going back in history about 40 years earlier in 1935. For Stanley, this was the great labor cop-out. This was the end of labor, really, in a way, as we had known it. And in many, many senses, going back to this, this moment of labor peace being established between giving the away bosses the right and the strike? labor. Yeah. Is that part of it too, giving away the right to strike? Yes. How is yes. that? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Which but again is the myth of the left. Uh, the great working myth is the Sorellian notion of the general strike. As Manny was saying, to right. strike you not only are not paid, but you're withholding labor. You're withholding this stupid, meaningless labor as well, you know, yeah. which is kind of interesting because it's an, an act of you know, why work? <laughs> you know, this is another, you know, that Stanley's work also, I want to say this about false promises, how much effect it had. This, this book was mimeographed, the manuscript was mimeographed and sent around the Italian left to people such as Antonio Negri, Ferruccio Gambino was the one who actually mimeographed it and passed it around, probably one of the most leading vanguard movements in Western Europe of, of labor activists and, you know, really revolutionaries, right? So this is very interesting how it filtered through. You wanna say something to this, Manny? I see, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd like to say the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, yeah, sure, the, sure. Uh, uh, one of its provisions, and I think the most damning one, uh, uh, the provision is that during the uh, time of the contract, uh, during the period the contract is signed, if it's a three-year contract, workers cannot go on strike if the employer violates the agreement, uh, which essentially takes the teeth out of the workers' movement, takes the power out of the uh, workers' movement, and uh, kind of uh, exposes the individual laborer to the high levels of abuse and exploitation of the employer. So this is a really important uh, point. Uh, in you know, 1937, we have Flint, as I was saying before, where workers went, you know, took over the factory, uh, not, not only in uh, Flint, Michigan, but also in St. Louis at the Emerson uh, plants uh, where they produced uh, radios and electronics. Um, take it, you know, 30 years later, you, you start to see the effect of the NLRA, National Labor Relations Act, on the capacity of workers to engage in self-activity, to express themselves on the job, 
as um, uh, workers who are capable of advancing their own interests. And uh, you know, I don't think they liked working on these cars necessarily. They, they, these were very uh, flimsily uh, built cars. Uh, and uh, you know, General Motors was only interested in producing as many cars as possible, quantity over you know, quality whatsoever, so that the workers would never take pride in the work they're engaged in. But I'd like to say this about Stanley. You know, he is uh, part of a generation of scholars around labor who began to criticize uh, and to um, investigate uh, in some ways uh, the nature of the labor movement itself and organized labor. You know, these include people like Staunton Lind, who's written uh, very important works on uh, the alienation of the worker, the fact that workers have lost their control and abilities to uh, engage in collective action on the job and so forth. And I think that goes back to what Michael was saying a moment ago, La labor is highly alienated within the workplace. I think we all feel it uh, as workers today, I know Michael and I do, uh, that it's a very stressful process. It's something that is arduous and burdensome. It's something that we have to go back to every single day. And it's also something that, uh, you know, from an economic perspective, um, uh, does not necessarily advance uh, and uh, allow us to achieve our full abilities within uh, the sphere of life. Uh, our, li our lives are constrained and uh, set back uh, by uh, having to work uh, the nine to five, or in our cases today, nine to nine job. Uh, it's, uh, seven days or a week. 24 seven for teachers on exactly. the internet. <laughs> right. Is, is it one of yeah. the things though, yeah. that Stanley is calling for is a reaching beyond the labor movement uh, to civil rights, as you pointed out earlier, uh, Michael, to uh, w women's movement, fem feminism, uh, to national liberation struggles. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, he was, he was not that keen on uh, vanguard movements uh, or the governments that some of these liberation struggles uh, created. But he was always about expanding life in a sense, as you put it, the, uh, and enriching us through an understanding of music and connection between various people as well. But how does that play in his work too, the international well, yeah. aspect of this? If, you... if I could uh, just back up for a second. Sure. I mean, Stanley Aronowitz to me, is representative and is exemplary of the Gramscian notion. Antonio Gramsci had a concept of the organic intellectual. And the organic intellectual is someone who rises of its class upward, right? As a part of the emergent class who is always fighting the traditional dominant intellectuals, right? In, in many ways. And Stanley was so rooted in this organicity of his own background, you know, his his family, his mother especially, you know, who would keep the books on the union, you know, in the garment industry, right. and, you know, going forward, who, to whom he was very close, um, all the way through his days as a labor organizer uh, for the atomic um, uh, workers, right, as well as the oil industry, retail, you know, he had many, many various hats he wore during this period, including, and most people don't know this, he, he was friendly with Marvin Miller, who ultimately became the commissioner, I mean, not the commissioner, excuse me, the, the lawyer for Kurt Flood, the reserve clause reversal, right. and is now in the Hall of Fame. So I always joke with him, you could have been the commissioner, you know, or you could have been the, the players unions, uh, you know, chief in a way, you know, because Miller liked Stanley and they had a relationship in the steel workers. So right. this organicity, I mean, I think this is what defined him differently. This is someone who had a background, you know, or is someone who has a background in music, classical music, jazz, popular music, especially rock and roll. As we all know, he was married to Ellen Willis, who was one of the four quote horsemen, and I put the men in, in of the of the uh, rock and roll uh, you know group uh, with Grail Marcus, et cetera, et cetera, back in the day. So he had this popular culture moment as well, and wrote a book, Roll Over Beethoven, on popular culture. So we're not dealing with someone that just was fixed fixed in the labor struggles, collective bargaining struggles, et cetera. 
So for me, uh, yes, he always brought so much, and we've, we've talked about this countless times, but he brought so much to the table. You know, when, when Stanley would enter a room, you knew that there was a wealth, not only of knowledge, but connected knowledge. You know, it's not like it was dispersed, encyclopedic only, or something like that. It was always connected, and connected in a way back to what I think he considers the central problem, and which I see also as something that we really have to think think through, is the labor question. What does it mean to work? What does it mean to labor as we go forward in this digital age? What kind of emptiness are we beginning to experience in what I would call the hyper-industrial epoch following uh, Bernard Stiegler instead of just neoliberalism? So, Manny, I, Manny no, and, yeah. and you, you've, you're, 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 uh, I have a book that's coming out in March talking about uh, these sorts of issues, too, and going beyond protests. So can we try to tie that into what Michael just is saying? Uh, certainly, and actually, I'm going to try to uh, weave uh, Stanley Aronowitz, who actually cite in the book, is one of the few people in the West uh, that I cite, because uh, I feel that, uh, I don't feel, we know that the uh, United States is uh, only 4% of the world's population, and that 90% uh, of the world, uh, 94 even, uh, are workers in the global South. Uh, they are poor workers who uh, live uh, lives of uh, squalor. Uh, even, you know, I know that we complain a lot in this country and we should complain even more as conditions erode and we're exploited more, but in the global South, people are surviving every single day. Uh, they're having their land taken away from them uh, they're forced to migrate to urban areas to work in the most uh, destitute condition, places like uh, uh, Delhi in uh, India, uh, where steel workers uh, uh, work 18-hour uh, days, seven days a week, uh, and uh, they are people from the ages, young kids from the ages of 12 uh, on up to 40, which is about the time that most people are ready to go there, and as if you're working in a job. What I mean by that is uh, to the morgue. Uh, there is uh, constant industrial action, accidents that are taking place every single day. And so, you know, the meaning of work in a place like India, the Philippines and South Africa is a much more complex uh, set of questions about the very being and the capacity of people to, uh, to live every day. Um, where the extraction of surplus value is uh, much higher. Stanley Aronowitz was very much uh, attuned to the question of uh, the labor aristocracy. Uh, he uh, was a member of my union and Michael's union, the Professional Staff Congress. And he saw the, the ways in which uh, some academics uh, uh, or some you know, leaders and so forth uh, within the university were you know, treated on inequitably and so forth. And he did see a, a certain kind of privilege that uh, we have or had, I think more would be, had would be the better uh, term uh, at, at the time. And uh, so he also moved into the, uh, you know, so I, I, my work actually is, uh, I, I'm arguing that there is an absolute necessity to have political organization a working class organization, which would be a very strong militant revolutionary union, which I was, you, you were talking about uh, uh, anti-colonial struggles uh, that were yeah. taking place. Uh, uh, you know, today uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, semi-colonial struggles because countries like the Philippines, like South Africa, uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, I can go further, uh, 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 are really semi-colonial outposts of the United States and Western Europe to a large extent. So I, I'm looking at that question. I see Stanley's work is very important because he himself was uh, very disillusioned with, uh, yes, we do uh, hope that uh, certain results take place in the elections on Tuesday, uh, but uh, he was very disillusioned in the Democratic Party and its shift and move, you know, ineluctable move to a more conservative politics. Of course, it originated as a conservative party and stayed that way, in my view, and I think Stanley's view. And so, you know, he ran, you know, I think he ran for, well, I know he ran for governor uh, of the state of New York, uh, in large measure, you know, to advance the labor movement, to advance the conditions of uh, workers, the wages of workers uh, in upstate New York, where uh, 
people make far lower wages than uh, downstate and so forth. Um, so he, he recognized the importance of the political party. He did not want to see the linkages that uh, existed within, uh, I would say, our own union and the Democratic Party, uh, which he saw as corrupt uh, and in really ineffectual to a large extent. Um, and I actually also see that way, uh, you know, what's the point of having a political party when they're going to do precisely the same right. thing over and again? So he was suspicious of the a political parties, so-called vanguard parties as well. And, and he, he's written so much, as you all know, about prefigurative uh, political activity. Uh, Michael, you want to pick up on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, his book, Left Turn, I, I think uh, anticipates some of Manny's work today. Left, for, yeah. Left Turn was an attempt to look at how would we form new political organizations. You know, what does that mean to, to build a new political formation? And I think Stanley had it with the Democratic Party since 68. We've, we've had long, long discussions about this and probably even much earlier. And, you know, going back to where we began the show and Manny was speaking about labor in the 70s, you know, in a very different position than it is now. Well, when C. Wright Mills writes New Men of Power, he's really bemoaning the fact that labor did have real power, but really didn't take it, kind of gave in right. to right. the capital order in a way, which is another, you know, moment of, of time, the 50s, you know, the not so, you know, great uh, 50s of the unspoken uh, majority, uh, you know, et cetera, or the silent majority. Well, Michael, uh, he, Michael, he was yeah, certainly yeah, for yeah, the yeah. progressive policies uh, that Bernie Sanders might be expounding. In that well, for, for revolutionary reforms, Andre Gortz was a very, very important uh, influence on Stanley. That's you know, the critique of economic reason, you know, uh, farewell to the working class, which was not against the working class or split from the working class. It was an attempt to criticize where was that agency, you know, going back to this, this question, where is really the agency today? And as Manny speaks, right. we're in academic unions. I'm in one academic union at LIU, which is, I'm writing a piece. I'm, I'm putting the finishing touches on it because there's always something new in terms of its disgust. But, you know, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster unionism. And we're feeling this. I'm, I'm working from the hyperbolic position. However, on the other hand, it's working in all the unions. None of the unions are really standing up to anything. They fail. Look they who they, yeah, yeah, look who they bought, you know, et cetera. So we have very small, you know, and this, hence, false promises comes out of the slogan. I can read that. I, I wanted to do this, kind of the introduction, but I think it's important because he begins the book with a great song, the worker's song on false promises, you know, the clockmaker's union is no good union. It's a company union by the bosses. The old clockmakers and the socialist fakers by the workers are making double crosses. The Dubinskys, the Hillquists, the Thomases by the workers are making false promises. They preach socialism, but they practice fascism to serve capitalism by the bosses. This is the song, mm -hmm. False mm -hmm. Promises, and this is where he gets his title. And, you know, there's a lot to that song. Unfortunately, he's not here with us to sing it because he's good at singing, too. That well, people yeah. don't realize it about Sam. He loves and singing, singing labor songs, you uh, you know, affectionately and, and speaking. Yeah. The first show we did, yeah. he and Cornell, and I, we're, we were singing. Yes, we've got yes. we've got only a couple more minutes to go, and we are absolutely going to have to do another show. There's no question about it. We and will. We'll get start. Stanley singing. Yeah, we're going to have Stanley on. <laughs> we're gonna have Stanley, Stanley is going to be on the next. Okay, we're all sing yeah. whatever we want to sing here, whatever he wants to sing. I'm I'm going to tell him we're going to do a program on Stanley and music. His relationship to music. He'll love it because he, he was a violinist. You know, I joke with him that Einstein ended up playing violin on oh, Desolation oh. Row, but, you know, the Bob Dylan song. But yeah. anyway, it would be a lot of fun to do this with him in, in terms of music. And Manny knows a lot about music, too. So maybe he could join us. We'll all go to Stanley's apartment. We, we will. We will. And, yeah. Mike, and, and Manny, let me give you the last minute here. Yeah. Uh, of any I know we're gonna do this again. We're gonna do this again. That's that's seven. Yeah. Finish us off here with, with any comments, critiques you want to make within that last minute that we have of Stanley and his work or whatever. I think Stanley is the most important uh, 
sociologist of his generation who studies labor. Uh, I think that his work uh, has seminal influence throughout uh, uh, the United States. And uh, as Michael pointed out, it also had influence in the Italian left and the, the rise of a new kind of unionism. And the point I wanted to just make is that there, okay. Stanley was always, and he remained so, an optimist. You know, he might have say he might say that the union movement is dead, but he also will say we have to build a better one. And I think that is really kind of, uh, you know, encapsulizing it, it encapsulizes the way Stanley thought and thinks and, and lived uh, and, and lives. And, yeah, and we, yeah. we've got to, unfortunately... And Jim, uh, if I could just add, Manny brought up something very good. To echo Marx, you know, what he just said about the optimism of Stanley, Marx always said, the revolution is dead, long live the revolution. Absolutely. That is really the kind of, you know, tension we live. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Long yeah. live Stanley, long yeah. live us all and the revolution. Yeah. Thank you so very, very much, Manny and Michael. It's yeah. been a privilege and honor. Yeah. We will see you again very, very soon on we another show. So. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. very much. Thank all you. Good to see you. To the Thank radical you, Great Manny. seeing you. Okay. Take care.